Chapter One of the Extraordinary Adventures of Arsène Lupin, Gentleman Burglar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Barrett. The Extraordinary Adventures of Arsène Lupin, Gentleman Burglar, by Maurice Leblanc. Translated by George Moorhead. Chapter One, The Arrest of Arsène Lupin. It was a strange ending to a voyage that had commenced in a most auspicious manner. The transatlantic steamship La Provence was a swift and comfortable vessel under the command of a most affable man. The passengers constituted a select and delightful society. The charm of new acquaintances and improvised amusements served to make the time pass agreeably. We enjoyed the pleasant sensation of being separated from the world, living, as it were, upon an unknown island, and consequently obliged to be sociable with each other. Have you ever stopped to consider how much originality and spontaneity emanate from these various individuals who, on the preceding evening, did not even know each other, and who are now, for several days, condemned to lead a life of extreme intimacy, jointly defying the anger of the ocean? the terrible onslaught of the waves, the violence of the tempest, and the agonizing monotony of the calm and sleepy water. Such a life becomes a sort of tragic existence, with its storms and its grandeurs, its monotony and its diversity, and that is why, perhaps, we embark upon that short voyage with mingled feelings of pleasure and fear. But during the past few years a new sensation had been added to the life of the transatlantic traveller, the little floating island is now attached to the world from which it was once quite free. A bond united them even in the very heart of the watery wastes of the Atlantic. That bond is the wireless telegraph, by means of which we receive news in the most mysterious manner. We know full well that the message is not transported by the medium of a hollow wire. No, the mystery is even more inexplicable, more romantic and we must have recourse to the wings of the air in order to explain this new miracle. During the first day of the voyage we felt that we were being followed, escorted, preceded even, by that distant voice which, from time to time, whispered to one of us a few words from the receding world. Two friends spoke to me, ten, twenty others sent gay or sombre words of parting to other passengers. On the second day, at a distance of five hundred miles from the French coast, in the midst of a violent storm, we received the following message by means of the wireless telegraph. Arsène Lupin is on your vessel, first cabin, blonde hair, wound right forearm, travelling alone under the name of R. At that moment a terrible flash of lightning rent the stormy skies. The electric waves were interrupted. The remainder of the dispatch never reached us. Of the name under which Arsène Lupin was concealing himself, we knew only the initial. If the news had been of some other character, I have no doubt that the secret would have been carefully guarded by the telegraphic operator as well as by the officers of the vessel. But it was one of those events calculated to escape from the most rigorous discretion. The same day, no one knew how, the incident became a matter of current gossip and every passenger was aware that the famous Arsène Lupin was hiding in our midst. Arsène Lupin in our midst! The irresponsible burglar whose exploits had been narrated in all the newspapers during the past few months. The mysterious individual with whom Ganimard, our shrewdest detective, had been engaged in an implacable conflict amidst interesting and picturesque surroundings. Arsène Lupin! the eccentric gentleman who operates only in the chateaux and salons, and who one night entered the residence of Baron Schormann, but emerged empty-handed, leaving, however, his card on which he had scribbled these words, Arsène Lupin, gentleman burglar, will return when the furniture is genuine. Arsène Lupin, the man of a thousand disguises, in turn a chauffeur, detective, bookmaker, Russian physician, Spanish bullfighter, commercial traveller, robust youth, or decrepit old man. Then consider this startling situation. Arsène Lupin was wandering about within the limited bounds of a transatlantic steamer. 
in that very small corner of the world in that dining saloon in that smoking-room in that music-room arsene lupin was perhaps this gentleman or that one my neighbour at the table the sharer of my state-room and this condition of affairs will last for five days exclaimed miss nelly underdown next morning it is unbearable i hope he will be arrested then addressing me she added and you monsieur d'andrezy you are on intimate terms with the captain surely you know something i should have been delighted had i possessed any information that would interest miss nelly she was one of those magnificent creatures who inevitably attract attention in every assembly wealth and beauty form an irresistible combination and nelly possessed both educated in paris under the care of a french mother she was now going to visit her father the millionaire underdown of chicago she was accompanied by one of her friends lady Gerland. at first i had decided to open a flirtation with her but in the rapidly growing intimacy of the voyage i was soon impressed by her charming manner and my feelings became too deep and reverential for a mere flirtation moreover she accepted my attentions with a certain degree of favour she condescended to laugh at my witticisms and display an interest in my stories yet i felt that i had a rival in the person of a young man with quiet and refined tastes and it struck me at times that she preferred his taciturn humour to my parisian frivolity he formed one in the circle of admirers that surrounded miss nelly at the time she addressed to me the foregoing question we were all comfortably seated in our deck chairs the storm of the preceding evening had cleared the sky the weather was now delightful i have no definite knowledge mademoiselle i replied but cannot we ourselves investigate the mystery quite as well as the detective ganimard the personal enemy of arsene lupin ho ho you are progressing very fast monsieur not at all mademoiselle in the first place let me ask do you find the problem a complicated one very complicated have you forgotten the key we hold for the solution to the problem what key in the first place lupin calls himself monsieur r rather vague information she replied secondly he is travelling alone does that help you she asked thirdly he is blonde well then we have only to peruse the passenger list and proceed by process of elimination i had that list in my pocket i took it out and glanced through it then i remarked i find that there are only thirteen men on the passenger list whose names begin with the letter r only thirteen yes in the first cabin and of those thirteen i find that nine of them are accompanied by women children or servants that leaves only four who are travelling alone first the marquis de ravardin secretary to the american ambassador interrupted miss nelly i know him major rawson i continued he is my uncle someone said monsieur revolta here exclaimed an italian whose face was concealed beneath a heavy black beard miss nelly burst into laughter and exclaimed <laughs> that gentleman can scarcely be called a blonde very well then i said we are forced to the conclusion that the guilty party is the last one on the list what is his name monsieur rosen does any one know him no one answered but miss nelly turned to the taciturn young man whose attentions to her had annoyed me and said well monsieur rosen why do you not answer all eyes were now turned upon him he was a blonde i must confess that i myself felt a shock of surprise and the profound silence that followed her question indicated that the others present also viewed the situation with a feeling of sudden alarm however the idea was an absurd one because the gentleman in question presented an air of the most perfect innocence why do i not answer he said because considering my name my position as a solitary traveller and the colour of my hair i have already reached the same conclusion and now think that i should be arrested he presented a strange appearance as he uttered these words his thin lips were drawn closer than usual and his face was ghastly pale 
whilst his eyes were streaked with blood. Of course he was joking, yet his appearance and attitude impressed us strangely. "'But you have not the wound,' said Miss Nelly naively. "'That is true,' he replied. "'I lack the wound.' Then he pulled up his sleeve, removing his cuff, and showed us his arm. But that action did not deceive me. He had shown us his left arm, and I was on the point of calling his attention to the fact when another incident diverted our attention. Lady Jarlin, Miss Nelly's friend, came running towards us in a state of great excitement, exclaiming, "'My jewels! My pearls! Someone has stolen them all!' No, they were not all gone, as we soon found out. The thief had taken only part of them. A very curious thing. Of the diamond sunbursts, jeweled pendants, bracelets and necklaces, the thief had taken not the largest, but the finest and most valuable stones. The mountings were lying upon the table. I saw them there, despoiled of their jewels, like flowers from which the beautiful coloured petals had been ruthlessly plucked. And this theft must have been committed at the time Lady Jarlin was taking her tea, in broad daylight, in a stateroom opening on a much frequented corridor, Moreover, the thief had been obliged to force open the door of the stateroom, search for the jewel case, which was hidden at the bottom of a hat box, open it, select his booty, and remove it from the mountings. Of course, all the passengers instantly reached the same conclusion. It was the work of Arsène Lupin. That day, at the dinner table, the seats to the right and left of Rosen remained vacant and during the evening it was rumoured that the captain had placed him under arrest, which information produced a feeling of safety and relief. We breathed once more. That evening we resumed our games and dances. Miss Nelly especially displayed a spirit of thoughtless gaiety which convinced me that if Rosen's attentions had been agreeable to her in the beginning, she had already forgotten them. Her charm and good humour completed my conquest. At midnight, under a bright moon, I declared my devotion with an ardour that did not seem to displease her. But next day, to our general amazement, Rosen was at liberty. We learned that the evidence against him was not sufficient. He had produced documents that were perfectly regular, which showed that he was the son of a wealthy merchant of Bordeaux. Besides, his arms did not bear the slightest trace of a wound. "'Documents! Certificates of birth!' exclaimed the enemies of Rosen. Of course, Arsène Lupin will furnish you as many as you desire. And as to the wound, he never had it, or he has removed it. Then it was proven that, at the time of the theft, Rosen was promenading on the deck. To which fact, his enemies replied that a man like Arsène Lupin could commit a crime without being actually present. And then, apart from all other circumstances, there remained one point which even the most sceptical could not answer who, except Rosen, was travelling alone, was a blonde, and bore a name beginning with R. To whom did the telegram point, if it were not Rosen? And when Rosen, a few minutes before breakfast, came boldly toward our group, Miss Nelly and Lady Jarlin arose and walked away. An hour later, a manuscript circular was passed from hand to hand amongst the sailors, the stewards, and the passengers of all classes, it announced that M. Louis Rosen offered a reward of ten thousand francs for the discovery of Arsène Lupin or other person in possession of the stolen jewels. "'And if no one assists me, I will unmask the scoundrel myself,' declared Rosen. Rosen against Arsène Lupin, or rather, according to current opinion, Arsène Lupin himself against Arsène Lupin. The contest promised to be interesting.' Nothing developed during the next two days. We saw Rosen wandering about day and night, searching, questioning, investigating. The captain also displayed commendable activity. He caused the vessel to be searched from stern to stern, ransacked every stateroom under the plausible theory that the jewels might be concealed anywhere except in the thief's own room. "'I suppose they will find out something soon,' remarked Miss Nelly to me. He may be a wizard, but he cannot make diamonds and pearls become invisible. Certainly not, I replied, but he should examine the lining of our hats and vests and everything we carry with us. Then, exhibiting my Kodak, 
a nine by twelve with which i had been photographing her in various poses i added in an apparatus no larger than that a person could hide all of lady gerland's jewels he could pretend to take pictures and no one would suspect the game but i have heard it said that every thief leaves some clue behind him that may be generally true i replied but there is one exception arsène lupin why because he concentrates his thoughts not only on the theft but on all the circumstances connected with it that could serve as a clue to his identity a few days ago you were more confident yes but since i have seen him at work and what do you think about it now she asked well in my opinion we are wasting our time and as a matter of fact the investigation had produced no result but in the meantime the captain's watch had been stolen he was furious he quickened his efforts and watched rosen more closely than before but on the following day the watch was found in the second officer's collar-box this incident caused considerable astonishment and displayed the humorous side of arsène lupin burglar though he was but dilettante as well he combined business with pleasure he reminded us of the author who almost died in a fit of laughter provoked by his own play certainly he was an artist in his particular line of work and whenever i saw rosen gloomy and reserved and thought of the double role that he was playing i accorded him a certain measure of admiration on the following evening the officer on deck duty heard groans emanating from the darkest corner of the ship he approached and found a man lying there his head enveloped in a thick grey scarf and his hands tied together with a heavy cord it was rosen he had been assaulted thrown down and robbed a card pinned to his coat bore these words arsene lupin accepts with pleasure the ten thousand francs offered by m rosen as a matter of fact the stolen pocket-book contained twenty thousand francs of course some accused the unfortunate man of having simulated this attack on himself but apart from the fact that he could not have bound himself in that manner it was established that the writing on the card was entirely different from that of rosen but on the contrary resembled the handwriting of arsène lupin as it was reproduced in an old newspaper found on board thus it appeared that rosen was not arsène lupin but was rosen the son of a bordeaux merchant and the presence of arsène lupin was once more affirmed and that in a most alarming manner such was the state of terror amongst the passengers that none would remain alone in a stateroom or wander singly in unfrequented parts of the vessel we clung together as a matter of safety and yet the most intimate acquaintances were estranged by a mutual feeling of distrust arsène lupin was now anybody and everybody our excited imaginations attributed to him miraculous and unlimited power. We supposed him capable of assuming the most unexpected disguises, of being by turns the highly respectable Major Rawson, or the noble Marquis de Raverdan, or even, for we no longer stopped with the accusing letter of R, or even such or such a person, well known to all of us, and having wife, children, and servants. The first wireless dispatches from America brought no news. At least the captain did not communicate any to us. The silence was not reassuring. Our last day on the steamer seemed interminable. We lived in constant fear of some disaster. This time it would not be a simple theft or a comparatively harmless assault. It would be a crime, a murder. No one imagined that Arsène Lupin would confine himself to those two trifling offences absolute master of the ship the authorities powerless he could do whatever he pleased our property and lives were at his mercy yet those were delightful hours for me since they secured to me the confidence of miss nelly deeply moved by those startling events and being of a highly nervous nature she spontaneously sought at my side a protection and security that i was pleased to give her inwardly i blessed arsène lupin had he not been the means of bringing me and miss nelly closer together thanks to him i could now indulge in delicious dreams of love and happiness dreams that i felt were not unwelcome to miss nelly her smiling eyes authorized me to make them the softness of her voice bade me hope 
as we approached the american shore the active search for the thief was apparently abandoned and we were anxiously awaiting the supreme moment in which the mysterious enigma would be explained who was arsène lupin under what name under what disguise was the famous arsène lupin concealing himself and at last that supreme moment arrived if i live one hundred years i shall not forget the slightest details of it how pale you are miss nelly i said to my companion as she leaned upon my arm almost fainting and you she replied ah oh, you are so changed just think this is a most exciting moment and i am delighted to spend it with you miss nelly i hope that your memory will sometimes revert but she was not listening she was nervous and excited the gangway was placed in position but before we could use it the uniformed customs officers came on board miss nelly murmured i shouldn't be surprised to hear that arsene lupin escaped from the vessel during the voyage perhaps he preferred death to dishonor and plunged into the atlantic rather than be arrested oh do not laugh she said suddenly i started and in answer to her question i said do you see that little old man standing at the bottom of the gangway with an umbrella and an olive-green coat it is ganimard ganimard yes the celebrated detective who has sworn to capture arsene lupin oh, i can understand now why we did not receive any news from this side of the atlantic ganimard was here and he always keeps his business secret then you think he will arrest arsene lupin who can tell the unexpected always happens when arsene lupin is concerned in the affair oh she exclaimed with that morbid curiosity peculiar to women i should like to see him arrested you will have to be patient no doubt arsene lupin has already seen his enemy and will not be in a hurry to leave the steamer the passengers were now leaving the steamer leaning on his umbrella with an air of careless indifference Ganimard appeared to be paying no attention to the crowd that was hurrying down the gangway. The Marquis de Raverdan, Major Rawson, the Italian Revolta, and many others had already left the vessel before Rosen appeared. Poor Rosen! Perhaps it is he after all, said Miss Nelly to me. What do you think? I think it would be very interesting to have Ganimard and Rosen in the same picture. You take the camera. I am loaded down. I gave her the camera, but too late for her to use it. Rosanne was already passing the detective. An American officer, standing behind Ganimard, leaned forward and whispered in his ear. The French detective shrugged his shoulders, and Rosanne passed on. Then, my God, who was Arsène Lupin? Yes, said Miss Nelly aloud, who can it be? Not more than twenty people now remained on board. She scrutinized them one by one, fearful that Arsène Lupin was not amongst them. "'We cannot wait much longer,' I said to her. She started toward the gangway. I followed. But we had not taken ten steps when Ganimard barred our passage. "'Well, what is it?' I exclaimed. "'One moment, monsieur. What's your hurry?' "'I am escorting mademoiselle.' "'One moment,' he repeated, in a tone of authority. Then, gazing into my eyes, he said, Arsène Lupin, is it not? I laughed and replied, <laughs> No, simply Bernard d'Andrézy. Bernard d'Andrézy died in Macedonia three years ago. If Bernard d'Andrézy were dead, I should not be here. But you are mistaken. Here are my papers. They are his, and I can tell you exactly how they came into your possession. "'You are a fool!' I exclaimed. "'Arsène Lupin sailed under the name of R. "'Yes, another of your tricks, a false scent that deceived them at Havre. "'You play a good game, my boy, but this time luck is against you.' "'I hesitated a moment. "'Then he hit me a sharp blow on the right arm, "'which caused me to utter a cry of pain. "'He had struck the wound yet unhealed, referred to in the telegram.' I was obliged to surrender. There was no alternative. I turned to Miss Nelly, who had heard everything. Our eyes met. Then she glanced at the Kodak I had placed in her hands. 
and made a gesture that conveyed to me the impression that she understood everything. Yes, there, between the narrow folds of black leather, in the hollow centre of the small object that I had taken the precaution to place in her hands before Ganimard arrested me, it was there I had deposited Rosen's twenty thousand francs and Lady Jarlin's pearls and diamonds. Oh, I pledge my oath that, at that solemn moment, when I was in the grasp of Ganimard and his two assistants, I was perfectly indifferent to everything, to my arrest, the hostility of the people, everything except this one question. What will Miss Nelly do with the things I had confided to her? In the absence of that material and conclusive proof, I had nothing to fear. But would Miss Nelly decide to furnish that proof? Would she betray me? Would she act the part of an enemy who cannot forgive, or that of a woman whose scorn is softened by feelings of indulgence and involuntary sympathy? She passed in front of me. I said nothing, but bowed very low. Mingled with the other passengers, she advanced to the gangway with my Kodak in her hand. It occurred to me that she would not dare to expose me publicly, but she might do so when she reached a more private place. However, when she had passed only a few feet down the gangway, with a movement of simulated awkwardness, she let the camera fall into the water between the vessel and the pier. Then she walked down the gangway, and was quickly lost to sight in the crowd. She had passed out of my life for ever. For a moment I stood motionless. Then, to Ganimard's great astonishment, I muttered, "'What a pity that I am not an honest man!' Such was the story of his arrest as narrated to me by Arsène Lupin himself. The various incidents, which I shall record in writing at a later day, have established between us certain ties, shall I say, of friendship. Yes, I venture to believe that Arsène Lupin honours me with his friendship, and that it is through friendship that he occasionally calls on me, and brings into the silence of my library his youthful exuberance of spirits the contagion of his enthusiasm, and the mirth of a man for whom destiny has not but favours and smiles. His portrait? How can I describe him? I have seen him twenty times, and each time he was a different person. Even he himself said to me on one occasion, I no longer know who I am. I cannot recognise myself in the mirror. Certainly he was a great actor, and possessed a marvellous faculty for disguising himself. Without the slightest effort he could adopt the voice, gestures, and mannerisms of another person. Why, said he, why should I retain a definite form and feature? Why not avoid the danger of a personality that is ever the same? My actions will serve to identify me. Then he added with a touch of pride, so much the better if no one can ever say with absolute certainty there is Arsène Lupin. The essential point is that the public may be able to refer to my work and say, without fear of mistake, Arsène Lupin did that. End of chapter 1《Part One of the Extraordinary Adventures of Arsène Lupin, Gentleman Burglar. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Extraordinary Adventures of Arsène Lupin, Gentleman Burglar, by Maurice Leblanc, translated by George Moorhead. Chapter Two, Arsène Lupin in Prison. There is no tourist worthy of the name who does not know the banks of the Seine and has not noticed in passing the little feudal castle of the Malachis built upon a rock in the centre of the river an arched bridge connects it with the shore. All around it the calm waters of the great river play peacefully amongst the reeds, and the wagtails flutter over the moist crests of the stones. The history of the Malachi castle is stormy like its name, harsh like its outlines. It has passed through a long series of combats, sieges, assaults, rapines, and massacres. A recital of the crimes that have been committed there would cause the stoutest heart to tremble. There are many mysterious legends connected with the castle, and they tell us of a famous subterranean tunnel 
that formerly led to the abbey of Jumiège and to the manor of Agnes Sorel, mistress of Charles the Seventh. In that ancient habitation of heroes and brigands, the Baron Nathan Caon now lived, or Baron Satan, as he was formerly called on the Bourse, where he had acquired a fortune with incredible rapidity. The lords of Malachy, absolutely ruined, had been obliged to sell the ancient castle at a great sacrifice. It contained an admirable collection of furniture, pictures, wood carvings, and faience. The Baron lived there alone attended by three old servants. No one ever enters the place. No one had ever beheld the three Rubens that he possessed, his two Watteaux, his Jean Goujon pulpit, and the many other treasures that he had acquired by a vast expenditure of money at public sales. Baron Satan lived in constant fear, not for himself, but for the treasures that he had accumulated with such an earnest devotion and with so much perspicacity that the shrewdest merchant could not say that the baron had ever erred in his taste or judgment. He loved them, his bibelot. He loved them intensely, like a miser, jealously, like a lover. Every day at sunset the iron gates at either end of the bridge and at the entrance to the court of honour are closed and barred. At the least touch on these gates electric bells will ring throughout the castle. One Thursday in September a letter-carrier presented himself at the gate at the head of the bridge, and, as usual, it was the Baron himself who partially opened the heavy portal. He scrutinized the man as minutely as if he were a stranger, although the honest face and twinkling eyes of the postman had been familiar to the Baron for many years. The man laughed as he said, <laughs> "'It is only I, Monsieur le Baron.' It is not another man wearing my cap and blouse. One can never tell, muttered the baron. The man handed him a number of newspapers, and then said, And now, monsieur le baron, here is something new. Something new? Yes, a letter, a registered letter. Living as a recluse, without friends or business relations, the baron never received any letters, and the one now presented to him immediately aroused within him a feeling of suspicion and distrust. It was like an evil omen. Who was this mysterious correspondent that dared to disturb the tranquillity of his retreat? You must sign for it, Monsieur le Baron. He signed, then took the letter, waited until the postman had disappeared beyond the bend in the road, and after walking nervously to and fro for a few minutes, he leaned against the parapet of the bridge and opened the envelope. It contained a sheet of paper bearing this heading, Prison de la Santé, Paris. He looked at the signature, Arsène Lupin. Then he read, Monsieur le Baron, there is in the gallery in your castle a picture of Philippe de Champagne of exquisite finish, which pleases me beyond measure. Your Rubens are also to my taste, as well as your smallest Watteau. In the salon to the right I have noticed the Louis XIII cadence table, the tapestries of Beauvais, the Empire Guéridon signed Jacob, and the Renaissance chest. In the salon to the left all the cabinet full of jewels and miniatures. For the present I will content myself with those articles that can be conveniently removed. I will therefore ask you to pack them carefully and ship them to me, charges prepaid, to the station at Batignolles within eight days, otherwise I shall be obliged to remove them myself during the night of twenty-seven September. But under those circumstances I shall not content myself with the articles above mentioned. Accept my apologies for any inconvenience I may cause you, and believe me to be your humble servant, Arsène Lupin. P.S. Please do not send the largest Watteau, Although you paid thirty thousand francs for it, it is only a copy, the original having been burned under the Directoire by Barat during a night of debauchery. Consult the memoirs of Garat. I do not care for the Louis XV Châtelaine, as I doubt its authenticity. That letter completely upset the Baron. Had it borne any other signature, he would have been greatly alarmed. 
but signed by Arsène Lupin. As an habitual reader of the newspapers, he was versed in the history of recent crimes, and was therefore well acquainted with the exploits of the mysterious burglar. Of course he knew that Lupin had been arrested in America by his enemy Ganimard, and was at present incarcerated in the prison de la Santé. But he knew also that any miracle might be expected from Arsène Lupin. Moreover, that exact knowledge of the castle, the location of the pictures and furniture, gave the affair an alarming aspect. How could he have acquired that information concerning things that no one had ever seen? The baron raised his eyes and contemplated the stern outlines of the castle, its steep, rocky pedestal, the depth of the surrounding water, and shrugged his shoulders. Certainly there was no danger. No one in the world could force an entrance to the sanctuary that contained his priceless treasures. No one, perhaps, but Arsène Lupin. For him, gates, walls, and drawbridges did not exist. What use were the most formidable obstacles or the most careful precautions if Arsène Lupin had decided to effect an entrance? That evening he wrote to the procureur of the République at Rouen. He enclosed the threatening letter and solicited aid and protection. The reply came at once to the effect that Arsène Lupin was in custody in the prison de la Santé, under close surveillance, with no opportunity to write such a letter, which was no doubt the work of some impostor. But, as an act of precaution, the procureur had submitted the letter to an expert in handwriting, who declared that, in spite of certain resemblances, the writing was not that of the prisoner. But the words, in spite of certain resemblances, caught the attention of the baron. In them he read the possibility of a doubt which appeared to him quite sufficient to warrant the intervention of the law. His fears increased. He read Lupin's letter over and over again. I shall be obliged to remove them myself. And then there was the fixed date, the night of 27 September. To confide in his servants was a proceeding repugnant to his nature. But now, for the first time in many years, he experienced the necessity of seeking counsel with someone. Abandoned by the legal official of his own district, and feeling unable to defend himself with his own resources, he was on the point of going to Paris to engage the services of a detective. Two days passed. On the third day, he was filled with hope and joy as he read the following item in the Réveil de Caudebec, a newspaper published in a neighboring town. We have the pleasure of entertaining in our city, at the present time, the veteran detective M. Ganimard, who acquired a world-wide reputation by his clever capture of Arsène Lupin. He has come here for rest and recreation, and being an enthusiastic fisherman, he threatens to capture all the fish in our river. Ganimard! Ah, oh, here is the assistance desired by Baron Caorn. Who could baffle the schemes of Arsène Lupin better than Ganimard, the patient and astute detective? He was the man for the place. The baron did not hesitate. The town of Caudebec was only six kilometers from the castle, a short distance to a man whose step was accelerated by the hope of safety. After several fruitless attempts to ascertain the detective's address, the baron visited the office of the Réveil, situated on the quai. There he found the writer of the article, who, approaching the window, exclaimed, Ganimard? Why, you are sure to see him somewhere on the quai with his fishing-pole. I met him there and chanced to read his name engraved on his rod. Ah, there he is now, under the trees. That little man wearing a straw hat? Exactly. He is a gruff fellow, with little to say. Five minutes later, the baron approached the celebrated Ganimard, introduced himself, and sought to commence a conversation, but that was a failure. Then he broached the real object of his interview, and briefly stated his case. The other listened, motionless, with his attention riveted on his fishing-rod. When the baron had finished his story, the fisherman turned, with an air of profound pity, and said, Monsieur, it is not customary for thieves to warn people they are about to rob. Arsène Lupin especially would not commit such a folly. But, monsieur, if I had the least doubt, believe me, 
the pleasure of again capturing arsene lupin would place me at your disposal but unfortunately that young man is already under lock and key he may have escaped no one ever escaped from the sante but he he no more than any other yet well if he escapes so much the better i will catch him again meanwhile you go home and sleep soundly that will do for the present you frighten the fish the conversation was ended the baron returned to the castle reassured to some extent by ganimard's indifference he examined the bolts watched the servants and during the next forty-eight hours he became almost persuaded that his fears were groundless certainly as ganimard had said thieves do not warn people they are about to rob the fateful day was close at hand it was now the twenty-sixth of september and nothing had happened but at three o'clock the bell rang a boy brought this telegram no goods at the batignolles station prepare everything for to-morrow night arsene this telegram threw the baron into such a state of excitement that he even considered the advisability of yielding to lupin's demands however he hastened to Quebec. Ganimard was fishing at the same place, seated on a camp-stool. Without a word, he handed him the telegram. "'Well, what of it?' said the detective. "'What of it? But it is to-morrow.' "'What is to-morrow?' "'The robbery! The pillage of my collections!' Ganimard laid down his fishing-rod, turned to the baron, and exclaimed, in a tone of impatience, "'Ah!' Oh, do you think i am going to bother myself about such a silly story as that how much do you ask to pass to-morrow night in the castle not a sou now leave me alone name your own price i am rich and can pay it this offer disconcerted ganimard who replied calmly i am here on vacation i have no right to undertake such work no one will know i promise to keep it secret oh nothing will happen come three thousand francs will that be enough the detective after a moment's reflection said very well but i must warn you that you are throwing your money out of the window i do not care in that case but after all what do we know about this devil lupin he may have quite a numerous band of robbers with him are you sure of your servants my faith better not count on them i will telegraph for two of my men to help me and now go it is better for us not to be seen together to-morrow evening about nine o'clock the following day the day fixed by arsene lupin baron caon arranged all his panoply of war furbished his weapons and like a sentinel paced to and fro in front of the castle he saw nothing heard nothing at half-past eight o'clock in the evening he dismissed his servants. They occupied rooms in a wing of the building, in a retired spot, well removed from the main portion of the castle. Shortly thereafter, the baron heard the sound of approaching footsteps. It was Ganimard and his two assistants, great, powerful fellows with immense hands and necks like bulls. After asking a few questions relating to the location of the various entrances and rooms, Ganimard carefully closed and barricaded all the doors and windows through which one could gain access to the threatened rooms. He inspected the walls, raised the tapestries, and finally installed his assistants in the central gallery which was located between the two salons. No nonsense. We are not here to sleep. At the slightest sound, open the windows of the court and call me. Pay attention also to the waterside. Ten meters of perpendicular rock is no obstacle to those devils. Ganimard locked his assistants in the gallery, carried away the keys, and said to the baron, And now to our post. He had chosen for himself a small room located in the thick outer wall between the two principal doors, and which in former years had been the watchman's quarters. A peephole opened upon the bridge, another on the court. In one corner there was an opening to a tunnel. "'I believe you told me, Monsieur le Baron, that this tunnel is the only subterranean entrance to the castle, and that it has been closed up for time immemorial?' "'Yes.' 
then unless there is some other entrance known only to arsene lupin we are quite safe he placed three chairs together stretched himself upon them lighted his pipe and sighed <sighs> really monsieur le baron i feel ashamed to take your money for such a sinecure as this i will tell the story to my friend lupin he will enjoy it immensely the baron did not laugh he was anxiously listening but heard nothing save the beating of his own heart from time to time he leaned over the tunnel and cast a fearful eye into its depths he heard the clock strike eleven twelve one suddenly he seized ganimard's arm the latter leapt up awakened from his sleep do you hear asked the baron in a whisper yes what is it i was snoring i suppose no no listen ah yes it is the horn of an automobile well well it is very improbable that lupin would use an automobile like a battering-ram to demolish your castle come monsieur le baron return to your post i am going to sleep good night that was the only alarm ganimard resumed his interrupted slumbers and the baron heard nothing except the regular snoring of his companion at break of day they left the room the castle was enveloped in a profound calm it was a peaceful dawn on the bosom of a tranquil river they mounted the stairs caon radiant with joy ganimard calm as usual they heard no sound they saw nothing to arouse suspicion what did i tell you monsieur le baron really i should not have accepted your offer i am ashamed he unlocked the door and entered the gallery upon two chairs with drooping heads and pendant arms the detective's two assistants were asleep tonnerre de nom d'un chien exclaimed ganimard at the same moment the baron cried out the pictures the credence he stammered choked with arms outstretched toward the empty places toward the denuded walls where naught remained but the useless nails and cords the watteau disappeared the rubens carried away the tapestries taken down the cabinets despoiled of their jewels and my louis the sixteenth candelabra and the regent chandelier and my twelfth-century virgin he ran from one spot to another in wildest despair he recalled the purchase price of each article added up the figures counted his losses pell-mell in confused words and unfinished phrases he stamped with rage he groaned with grief he acted like a ruined man whose only hope is suicide if anything could have consoled him, it would have been the stupefaction displayed by Ganimard. The famous detective did not move. He appeared to be petrified. He examined the room in a listless manner. The windows? Closed. The locks on the doors? Intact. Not a break in the ceiling, not a hole in the floor. Everything was in perfect order. The theft had been carried out methodically, according to a logical and inexorable plan. Arsène Lupin! Arsène Lupin! he muttered. Suddenly, as if moved by anger, he rushed upon his two assistants and shook them violently. They did not awaken. The devil! he cried. Can it be possible? He leaned over them and in turn examined them closely they were asleep but their response was unnatural they have been drugged he said to the baron by whom by him of course or his men under his discretion that work bears his stamp oh, in that case i am lost nothing can be done nothing assented ganimard it is dreadful it is monstrous lodge a complaint what good will that do oh it is well to try it the law has some resources the law <laughs> it is useless 
you represent the law and at this moment when you should be looking for a clue and trying to discover something you do not even stir discover something with arsene lupin why my dear monsieur arsene lupin never leaves any clue behind him he leaves nothing to chance sometimes i think he put himself in my way and simply allowed me to arrest him in america then i must renounce my pictures he has taken the gems of my collection i would give a fortune to recover them if there is no other way let him name his own price ganimard regarded the baron attentively as he said now that is sensible will you stick to it yes yes but why an idea that i have what is it we will discuss it later if the official examination does not succeed but not one word about me if you wish my assistance he added between his teeth it is true i have nothing to boast of in this affair the assistants were gradually regaining consciousness with the bewildered air of people who come out of a hypnotic sleep they opened their eyes and looked about them in astonishment ganimard questioned them they remembered nothing but you must have seen some one no can't you remember no no did you drink anything they considered a moment and then one of them replied yes i drank a little water out of that corral yes so did i declared the other ganimard smelled and tasted it it had no particular taste and no odor come he said we are wasting our time here one can't decide an arsene lupin problem in five minutes but morbleu i swear i will catch him again the same day a charge of burglary was duly performed by baron caon against arsene lupin a prisoner in the prison de la santé end of chapter two part one of the extraordinary adventures of arsene lupin gentleman burglar this librivox recording is in the public domain the extraordinary adventures of arsene lupin gentleman burglar by maurice leblanc chapter two arsene lupin in prison part two the baron afterwards regretted making the charge against lupin when he saw his castle delivered over to the gendarmes the procureur the juge d'instruction the newspaper reporters and photographers and a throng of idle curiosity seekers the affair soon became a topic of general discussion and the name of arsène lupin excited the public imagination to such an extent that the newspapers filled their columns with the most fantastic stories of his exploits which found ready credence amongst their readers but the letter of arsène lupin that was published in the echo de france no one ever knew how the newspaper obtained it that letter in which baron caron was impudently warned of the coming theft caused considerable excitement the most fabulous theories were advanced some recalled the existence of the famous subterranean tunnels and that was the line of research pursued by the officers of the law who searched the house from top to bottom questioned every stone studied the wainscoting and the chimneys the window frames and the girders in the ceilings by the light of torches they examined the immense cellars where the lords of malachy were wont to store their munitions and provisions they sounded the rocky foundation to its very centre but it was all in vain they discovered no trace of a subterranean tunnel no secret passage existed but the eager public declared that the pictures and furniture could not vanish like so many ghosts. They are substantial material things, and require doors and windows for their exits and their entrances, and so do the people that remove them. Who were those people? How did they gain access to the castle? And how did they leave it? The police officers of Rouen, convinced of their own impotence, solicited the assistance of the Parisian detective force. M. Doudoui, chief of the Sûreté, sent the best sleuths of the Iron Brigade. He himself spent forty-eight hours at the castle, but met with no success. 
then he sent for ganimard whose past services had proved so useful when all else failed ganimard listened in silence to the instructions of his superior then shaking his head he said in my opinion it is useless to ransack the castle the solution of the problem lies elsewhere where then with arsene lupin with arsene lupin to support that theory we must admit his intervention i do admit it in fact i consider it quite certain come ganimard that is absurd arsene lupin is in prison i grant you that arsene lupin is in prison closely guarded but he must have fetters on his feet manacles on his wrists and gag in his mouth before i change my opinion why so obstinate ganimard because arsene lupin is the only man in france of sufficient calibre to invent and carry out a scheme of that magnitude mere words ganimard but true ones look what are they doing searching for subterranean passages stones swinging on pivots and other nonsense of that kind but lupin doesn't employ such old-fashioned methods he is a modern cracksman right up to date and how would you proceed i should ask your permission to spend an hour with him in his cell yes during the return trip from america we became very friendly and i venture to say that if he can give me any information without compromising himself he will not hesitate to save me from incurring useless trouble it was shortly after noon when ganimard entered the cell of arsene lupin the latter who was lying on his bed raised his head and uttered a cry of apparent joy ah oh, this is a real surprise my dear ganimard here ganimard himself in my chosen retreat i have felt a desire for many things but my fondest wish was to receive you here very kind of you i am sure not at all you know i hold you in the highest regard i am proud of it i have always said ganimard is our best detective he is almost you see how candid i am he is almost as clever as sherlock holmes but i am sorry that i cannot offer you anything better than this hard stool and no refreshments not even a glass of beer of course you will excuse me as i am here only temporarily ganimard smiled and accepted the proffered seat then the prisoner continued monsieur how pleased i am to see the face of an honest man i am so tired of those devils of spies who come here ten times a day to ransack my pockets and my cell to satisfy themselves that i am not preparing to escape the government is very solicitous on my account it is quite right why so i should be quite contented if they would allow me to live in my own quiet way on other people's money quite so that would be so simple but here i am joking and you are no doubt in a hurry so let us come to business ganimard to what do i owe the honour of this visit the caon affair declared ganimard frankly ah oh, wait a moment you see i have had so many affairs first let me fix in my mind the circumstances of this particular case ah oh, yes now i have it the caon affair malachy castle seine inferieure two rubens a watteau and a few trifling articles trifling ah oh, ma foi all that is of slight importance but it suffices to know that the affair interests you how can i serve you ganimard must i explain to you what steps the authorities have taken in the matter not at all i have read the newspapers and i will frankly state that you have made very little progress and that is the reason i have come to see you i am entirely at your service in the first place the caon affair was managed by you from a to z the letter of warning the telegram all mine i ought to have the receipts here somewhere arsene opened the drawer of a small table of plain white wood which with the bed and stool constituted all the furniture in his cell and took therefrom two scraps of paper which he handed to ganimard ha huh, exclaimed the detective in surprise i thought you were closely guarded and searched 
and I find that you read the newspapers and collect postal receipts. Oh, these people are so stupid. They open the lining of my vest, they examine the soles of my shoes, they sound the walls of my cell, but they never imagine that Arsène Lupin would be foolish enough to choose such a simple hiding-place. Ganimard laughed as he said, <laughs> What a droll fellow you are! Really, you bewilder me. But come now, tell me about the Caron affair. Oh, ho, not quite so fast. You would rob me of all my secrets, expose all my little tricks. That is a very serious matter. Was I wrong to count on your complacence? No, Ganimard, and since you insist. Arsène Lupin paced his cell two or three times, then, stopping before Ganimard, he asked, "'What do you think of my letter to the baron?' "'I think you were amusing yourself by playing to the gallery.' "'Ha! Oh, playing to the gallery! Come, Ganimard, I thought you knew me better. Do I, Arsène Lupin, ever waste my time on such puerilities? Would I have written that letter if I could have robbed the baron without writing to him?' I want you to understand that the letter was indispensable. It was the motor that set the whole machine in motion. Now let us discuss together a scheme for the robbery of the Malachy Castle. Are you willing? Yes, proceed. Well, let us suppose a castle carefully closed and barricaded, like that of the Baron Caron. Am I to abandon my scheme and renounce the treasures that I covet? upon the pretext that the castle which holds them is inaccessible? Evidently not. Should I make an assault upon the castle at the head of a band of adventurers, as they did in ancient times? That would be foolish. Can I gain admittance by stealth or cunning? Impossible. Then there is only one way open to me. I must have the owner of the castle invite me to it. That is surely an original method. And how easy! Let us suppose that one day the owner receives a letter warning him that a notorious burglar known as Arsène Lupin is plotting to rob him. What will he do? Send a letter to the procureur. Who will laugh at him because the said Arsène Lupin is actually in prison? Then, in his anxiety and fear, the simple man will ask the assistance of the first comer, will he not? Very likely and if he happens to read in a country newspaper that a celebrated detective is spending his vacation in a neighboring town, he will seek that detective. Of course, but on the other hand, let us presume that, having foreseen that state of affairs, the said Arsène Lupin has requested one of his friends to visit Caudebec, make the acquaintance of the editor of the Réveil, a newspaper to which the Baron is a subscriber, and let said editor understand that such person is the celebrated detective. Then what will happen? The editor will announce in the Réveil the presence in Quebec of said detective. Exactly. And one of two things will happen. Either the fish, I mean Caon, will not bite, and nothing will happen, or, what is more likely, he will run and greedily swallow the bait. Thus behold my Baron Caon imploring the assistance of one of my friends against me. Original indeed. Of course the pseudo-detective at first refuses to give any assistance. On top of that comes the telegram from Arsène Lupin. The frightened Baron rushes once more to my friend, and offers him a definite sum of money for his services. My friend accepts, and summons two members of our band who, during the night, whilst Caon is under the watchful eye of his protector, removes certain articles by way of the window, and lowers them with ropes into a nice little launch chartered for the occasion. Simple, isn't it? Marvellous! Marvellous! exclaimed Ganimard. The boldness of the scheme and the ingenuity of all its details are beyond criticism. But who is the detective whose name and fame served as a magnet to attract the baron, and draw him into your net. There is only one name could do it, only one. And that is Arsène Lupin's personal enemy, the most illustrious Ganimard. I? Yourself, Ganimard. And really it is very funny. 
If you go there and the Baron decides to talk, you will find that it will be your duty to arrest yourself, just as you arrested me in America. <laughs> the revenge is really amusing. I cause Ganimard to arrest Ganimard. Arsène Lupin laughed heartily. The detective, greatly vexed, bit his lips. To him the joke was quite devoid of humor. The arrival of a prison guard gave Ganimard an opportunity to recover himself. The man brought Arsène Lupin's luncheon, furnished by a neighboring restaurant. After depositing the tray upon the table, the guard retired. Lupin broke his bread, ate a few morsels, and continued. But rest easy, my dear Ganimard. You will not go to Malachy. I can tell you something that will astonish you. The Caon affair is on the point of being settled. Excuse me, I have just seen the chief of the Sûreté. What of that? Does M. Dudouis know my business better than I do myself? You will learn that Ganimard, excuse me, that pseudo-Ganimard, still remains on very good terms with the Baron. The latter has authorized him to negotiate a very delicate transaction with me, and at the present moment, in consideration of a certain sum, it is probable that the Baron has recovered possession of his pictures and other treasures, and on their return he will withdraw his complaint. Thus there is no longer any theft, and the law must abandon the case. Ganimard regarded the prisoner with a bewildered air. And how do you know all that? Well, I've just received the telegram I was expecting. You have just received a telegram? This very moment, my dear friend. Out of politeness I did not wish to read it in your presence, but if you will permit me. You are joking, Lupin. My dear friend, if you will be so kind as to break that egg, you will learn for yourself that I am not joking. Mechanically, Ganimard obeyed and cracked the eggshell with the blade of a knife. He uttered a cry of surprise. The shell contained nothing but a small piece of blue paper. At the request of Arsène, he unfolded it. It was a telegram, or rather a portion of a telegram, from which the postmarks had been removed. It read as follows. Contract closed. Hundred thousand balls delivered. All well. One hundred thousand balls, said Ganimard. Yes, one hundred thousand francs. Very little, but then you know these are hard times, and I have some heavy bills to meet. If you only knew my budget, living in the city comes very high. Ganimard arose. His ill humor had disappeared. He reflected for a moment, glancing over the whole affair in an effort to discover a weak point. Then, in a tone and manner that betrayed his admiration of the prisoner, he said, Fortunately, we do not have a dozen such as you to deal with. If we did, we would have to close up shop. Arsène Lupin assumed a modest air as he replied, Pah! A person must have some diversion to occupy his leisure hours, especially when he is in prison. What? exclaimed Ganimard. Your trial, your defence, the examination, isn't that sufficient to occupy your mind? No, because I have decided not to be present at my trial. Ho, oh, ho! Arsène Lupin repeated positively, I shall not be present at my trial. Really? Ah, oh, my dear monsieur, do you suppose I am going to rot upon the wet straw? You insult me. Arsène Lupin remains in prison just as long as it pleases him, and not one minute more. Perhaps it would have been more prudent if you had avoided getting there, said the detective ironically. Ah, oh, monsieur jests. Monsieur must remember that he had the honour to effect my arrest. Know then, my worthy friend, that no one, not even you, could have placed a hand upon me if a much more important event had not occupied my attention at that critical moment. You astonish me. A woman was looking at me, Ganimard, and I loved her. Do you fully understand what that means, to be under the eyes of a woman that one loves? I cared for nothing in the world but that. And that is why I am here. Permit me to say you have been here a long time. In the first place I wished to forget. Do not laugh. It was a delightful adventure, 
and it is still a tender memory. Besides, I have been suffering from neurasthenia. Life is so feverish these days that it is necessary to take the rest cure occasionally, and I find this spot a sovereign remedy for my tired nerves. Arsène Lupin, you are not a bad fellow after all. Thank you, said Lupin. Ganimard, this is Friday. On Wednesday next, at four o'clock in the afternoon, I will smoke my cigar at your house in the Rue Pergolaise. Arsène Lupin, I will expect you. They shook hands like two old friends who valued each other at their true worth. Then the detective stepped to the door. Ganimard? What is it? asked Ganimard as he turned back. You have forgotten your watch. My watch? yes it strayed into my pocket he returned the watch excusing himself pardon me a bad habit because they have taken mine is no reason why i should take yours besides i have a chronometer here that satisfies me fairly well he took from the drawer a large gold watch and heavy chain from whose pocket did that come asked ganimard Arsène Lupin gave a hasty glance at the initials engraved on the watch. J.B. Who the devil can that be? Oh, yes, I remember. Jules Bouvier, the judge who conducted my examination. A charming fellow. End of chapter 2「Part 1 of the Extraordinary Adventures of Arsène Lupin » Gentleman Burglar. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Extraordinary Adventures of Arsène Lupin, Gentleman Burglar, by Maurice Leblanc. Chapter 3. The Escape of Arsène Lupin. Part 1. Arsène Lupin had just finished his repast, and taken from his pocket an excellent cigar with a gold band, which he was examining with unusual care when the door of his cell was opened. He had barely time to throw the cigar into the drawer and move away from the table. The guard entered. It was the hour for exercise. "'I was waiting for you, my dear boy,' exclaimed Lupin, in his accustomed good humour. They went out together. As soon as they had disappeared at a turn in the corridor, two men entered the cell and commenced a minute examination of it. One was Inspector Duzzi, the other was Inspector Follenfant. They wished to verify their suspicion that Arsène Lupin was in communication with his accomplices outside of the prison. On the preceding evening, the Grand Journal had published these lines, addressed to its court reporter. Monsieur, in a recent article you referred to me in most unjustifiable terms. Some days before the opening of my trial, I will call you to account. Arsène Lupin the handwriting was certainly that of Arsène Lupin. Consequently, he sent letters, and no doubt received letters. It was certain that he was preparing for that escape thus arrogantly announced by him. The situation had become intolerable. Acting in conjunction with the examining judge, the chief of the Sûreté, M. Dudouis, had visited the prison and instructed the jailer in regard to the precautions necessary to ensure Lupin's safety. At the same time, he sent the two men to examine the prisoner's cell. They raised every stone, ransacked the bed, did everything customary in such a case, but they discovered nothing, and were about to abandon their investigation when the guard entered hastily and said, "'The drawer! Look in the table drawer! When I entered just now, he was closing it!' They opened the drawer, and Dutzi exclaimed, "'Ah! Oh, we have him this time!' Follenfant stopped him. Wait a moment. The chief will want to make an inventory. This is a very choice cigar. Leave it there and notify the chief. Two minutes later, M. Dudouis examined the contents of the drawer. First he discovered a bundle of newspaper clippings relating to Arsène Lupin, taken from the Argus de la Presse, then a tobacco box, a pipe, some paper called onion peel, and two books. He read the titles of the books. One was an English edition of Carlyle's Hero Worship. The other was a charming Elsevier in modern binding, the Manual of Epictetus, a German translation published at Leyden in 1634. 
on examining the books he found that all the pages were underlined and annotated were they prepared as a code for correspondence or did they simply express the studious character of the reader then he examined the tobacco-box and the pipe finally he took up the famous cigar with its gold band Fichtre, he exclaimed our friend smokes a good cigar it's a henry clay with the mechanical action of a habitual smoker he placed the cigar close to his ear and squeezed it to make it crack immediately he uttered a cry of surprise the cigar had yielded under the pressure of his fingers he examined it more closely and quickly discovered something white between the leaves of tobacco delicately with the aid of a pin he withdrew a roll of very thin paper scarcely larger than a toothpick it was a letter he unrolled it and found these words written in a feminine handwriting the basket has taken the place of the others eight out of ten are ready on pressing the outer foot the plate goes downward from twelve to sixteen every day h p will wait but where reply at once rest easy your friend is watching over you m doudouis reflected a moment then said it is quite clear the basket the eight compartments from twelve to sixteen means from twelve to four o'clock but this h p that will wait h p must mean automobile h p horsepower is the way they indicate strength of the motor a twenty-four h p is an automobile of twenty-four horsepower then he rose and asked had the prisoner finished his breakfast yes and as he has not yet read the message which is proved by the condition of the cigar it is probable that he had just received it how in his food concealed in his bread or in a potato perhaps impossible his food was allowed to be brought in simply to trap him but we have never found anything in it we will look for lupin's reply this evening detain him outside for a few minutes i shall take this to the examining judge and if he agrees with me we will have the letter photographed at once and in an hour you can replace the letter in the drawer in a cigar similar to this the prisoner must have no cause for suspicion it was not without a certain curiosity that m doudouis returned to the prison in the evening accompanied by inspector duzzi three empty plates were sitting on the stove in the corner he has eaten yes replied the guard duzzi please cut that macaroni into very small pieces and open that bread roll nothing no chief m doudouis examined the plates the fork the spoon and the knife an ordinary knife with a rounded blade. He turned the handle to the left, then to the right. It yielded and unscrewed. The knife was hollow and served as a hiding place for a sheet of paper. Pfft, he said, that is not very clever for a man like Arsène, but we mustn't lose any time. You, Duzzi, go and search the restaurant. Then he read the note. I trust to you, H. P. will follow at a distance every day. I will go ahead. Au revoir, dear friend. At last, cried M. Doudouis, rubbing his hands gleefully, I think we have the affair in our own hands. A little strategy on our part, and the escape will be a success, in so far as the arrest of his confederates are concerned. But if Arsène Lupin slips through your fingers, suggested the guard, we will have a sufficient number of men to prevent that if however he displays too much cleverness ma foi so much the worse for him as to his band of robbers since the chief refuses to speak the others must and as a matter of fact arsene lupin had very little to say for several months m jules bouvier the examining judge had exerted himself in vain the investigation had been reduced to a few uninteresting arguments between the judge and the advocate, Maître Danval, one of the leaders of the bar. From time to time, through courtesy, Arsène Lupin would speak. One day he said, "'Yes, Monsieur le juge, I quite agree with you. The robbery of the Crédit Lyonnais, the theft in the Rue de Babylone, the issue of the counterfeit banknotes, the burglaries at the various chateaux, 
Amesnil, Gouret, Amblevin, Grosseyer, Malaki. All my work, monsieur. I did it all. Then will you explain to me? It is useless. I confess everything in a lump, everything and even ten times more than you know nothing about. Wearied by his fruitless task, the judge had suspended his examinations, but he resumed them after the two intercepted messages were brought to his attention, and regularly at midday Arsène Lupin was taken from the prison to the dépôt in the prison van with a certain number of other prisoners. They returned about three or four o'clock. Now, one afternoon, this return trip was made under unusual conditions. The other prisoners not having been examined, it was decided to take back Arsène Lupin first. Thus he found himself alone in the vehicle. These prison vans, vulgarly called paniers à salade, or salad baskets, are divided lengthwise by a central corridor from which open ten compartments, five on either side. Each compartment is so arranged that the occupant must assume and retain a sitting posture, and consequently the five prisoners are seated one upon the other, and yet separated one from the other by partitions. A municipal guard, standing at one end, watches over the corridor. Arsène was placed in the third cell on the right, and the heavy vehicle started. He carefully calculated when they left the Quai de l'Horloge, and when they passed the Palais de Justice. Then, about the centre of the bridge Saint-Michel, with his outer foot, that is to say his right foot, he pressed upon the metal plate that closed his cell. Immediately something clicked, and the metal plate moved. He was able to ascertain that he was located between the two wheels. He waited, keeping a sharp lookout. The vehicle was proceeding slowly along the boulevard Saint-Michel. At the corner of Saint-Germain it stopped. A truck horse had fallen, the traffic having been interrupted, a vast throng of fiacres and omnibuses had gathered there. Arsène Lupin looked out. Another prison van had stopped close to the one he occupied. He moved the plate still farther, put his foot on one of the spokes of the wheel, and leapt to the ground. A coachman saw him, roared with laughter, then tried to raise an outcry, but his voice was lost in the noise of the traffic that had commenced to move again. Moreover, Arsène Lupin was already far away. He had run for a few steps, but once upon the sidewalk he turned and looked around. He seemed to scent the wind like a person who was uncertain which direction to take. Then, having decided, he put his hands in his pockets, and with the careless air of an idle stroller he proceeded up the boulevard. It was a warm, bright autumn day, and the cafés were full. He took a seat on the terrace of one of them. He ordered a bock and a package of cigarettes. He emptied his glass slowly, smoked one cigarette, and lighted a second. Then he asked the waiter to send the proprietor to him. When the proprietor came, Arsène spoke to him in a voice loud enough to be heard by everyone. "'I regret to say, monsieur, I have forgotten my pocket-book. Perhaps, on the strength of my name, you will be pleased to give me credit for a few days.' I am Arsène Lupin. The proprietor looked at him, thinking he was joking. But Arsène repeated, Lupin, prisoner at the Santé, but now a fugitive. I venture to assume that the name inspires you with perfect confidence in me. And he walked away, amidst shouts of laughter, whilst the proprietor stood amazed. Lupin strolled along the Rue Soufflot and turned into the Rue Saint-Jacques. He pursued his way slowly, smoking his cigarettes and looking into the shop windows. At the boulevard de Port-Royal he took his bearings, discovered where he was, and then walked in the direction of the Rue de la Santé. The high, forbidding walls of the prison were now before him. He pulled his hat forward to shade his face. Then, approaching the sentinel, he asked, "'Is this the prison de la Santé?' "'Yes.' "'I wish to regain my cell.' The van left me on the way, and I would not abuse. Now, young man, move along, quick, growled the sentinel. Pardon me, but I must pass through that gate, and if you prevent Arsène Lupin from entering the prison, it will cost you dear, my friend. Arsène Lupin, what are you talking about? 
i am sorry i haven't a card with me said arsene fumbling in his pockets the sentinel eyed him from head to foot in astonishment then without a word he rang a bell the iron gate was partly opened and arsene stepped inside almost immediately he encountered the keeper of the prison gesticulating and feigning a violent anger arsene smiled and said come monsieur don't play that game with me what they take the precaution to carry me alone in the van prepare a nice little obstruction and imagine i am going to take to my heels and rejoin my friends well and what about the twenty agents of the sûreté who accompanied us on foot in fiacre and on bicycles no the arrangement did not please me i should not have got away alive tell me monsieur did they count on that he shrugged his shoulders and added i beg of you monsieur not to worry about me when i wish to escape i shall not require any assistance on the second day thereafter the echo de france which had apparently become the official reporter of the exploits of arsene lupin it was said that he was one of its principal shareholders published a most complete account of this attempted escape the exact wording of the messages exchanged between the prisoner and his mysterious friend the means by which correspondence was constructed, the complicity of the police, the promenade on the boulevard Saint-Michel, the incident at the Café Soufflot, everything was disclosed. It was known that the search of the restaurant and its waiters by Inspector Duty had been fruitless, and the public also learned an extraordinary thing which demonstrated the infinite variety of resources that Lupin possessed. The prison van, in which he was being carried, was prepared for the occasion and substituted by his accomplices for one of the six vans which did service at the prison. The next escape of Arsène Lupin was not doubted by anyone. He announced it himself in categorical terms in a reply to M. Bouvier on the day following his attempted escape. The judge having made a jest about the affair, Arsène was annoyed, and firmly eyeing the judge, he said emphatically, Listen to me, monsieur. I give you my word of honor that this attempted flight was simply preliminary to my general plan of escape. I do not understand, said the judge. It is not necessary that you should understand. And the judge, in the course of that examination which was reported at length in the columns of the Echo de France, when the judge sought to resume his investigation, Arsène Lupin exclaimed, with an assumed air of lassitude, Mon Dieu, mon Dieu, what's the use? All these questions are of no importance. What? No importance? cried the judge. No, because I shall not be present at the trial. You will not be present? No, I have fully decided on that, and nothing will change my mind. Such assurance, combined with the inexplicable indiscretions that Arsène Lupin committed every day, served to annoy and mystify the officers of the law there were secrets known only to arsène lupin secrets that he alone could divulge but for what purpose did he reveal them and how arsène lupin was changed to another cell the judge closed his preliminary investigation no further proceedings were taken in his case for a period of two months during which time arsène was seen almost constantly lying on his bed with his face turned toward the wall. The changing of his cell seemed to discourage him. He refused to see his advocate. He exchanged only a few necessary words with his keepers. During the fortnight preceding his trial, he resumed his vigorous life. He complained of want of air. Consequently, early every morning he was allowed to exercise in the courtyard, guarded by two men. Public curiosity had not died out. Every day it expected to be regaled with news of his escape, and, it is true, he had gained a considerable amount of public sympathy by reason of his verve, his gaiety, his diversity, his inventive genius, and the mystery of his life. Arsène Lupin must escape. It was his inevitable fate. The public expected it, and was surprised that the event had been delayed so long. Every morning the prefect of police asked his secretary, well, has he escaped yet? No, Monsieur le Préfet. Tomorrow, probably. And on the day before the trial, a gentleman called at the office of the Grand Journal, 
asked to see the court reporter, threw his card in the reporter's face, and walked rapidly away. These words were written on the card. Arsène Lupin always keeps his promises. It was under these conditions that the trial commenced. An enormous crowd gathered at the court. Everybody wished to see the famous Arsène Lupin. They had a gleeful anticipation that the prisoner would play some audacious pranks upon the judge. Advocates and magistrates, reporters and men of the world, actresses and society women were crowded together on the benches provided for the public. It was a dark, sombre day, with a steady downpour of rain. Only a dim light pervaded the courtroom, and the spectators caught a very indistinct view of the prisoner when the guards brought him in. But his heavy, shambling walk, the manner in which he dropped into his seat, and his passive, stupid appearance, were not at all prepossessing. Several times his advocate, one of M. Danval's assistants, spoke to him, but he simply shook his head and said nothing. The clerk read the indictment, then the judge spoke. Prisoner at the bar, stand up. Your name, age, and occupation? Not receiving any reply, the judge repeated, Your name? I ask you your name. A thick, slow voice muttered, Baudru, Désiré. A murmur of surprise pervaded the courtroom, but the judge proceeded, Baudru, Désiré? Ah, a new alias! Well, as you have already assumed a dozen different names, and this one is, no doubt, as imaginary as the others, we will adhere to the name of Arsène Lupin, by which you are more generally known. The judge referred to his notes and continued, for, despite the most diligent search, your past history remains unknown. Your case is unique in the annals of crime. We know not whom you are, whence you came, your birth and breeding. All is a mystery to us. Three years ago you appeared in our midst as Arsène Lupin, presenting to us a strange combination of intelligence and perversion, immorality and generosity. Our knowledge of your life prior to that date is vague and problematical. It may be that the man called Rostat, who, eight years ago, worked with Dixon, the prestidigitator, was none other than Arsène Lupin. It is probable that the Russian student who, six years ago, attended the laboratory of Dr. Altier at the St. Louis Hospital, and who often astonished the doctor by the ingenuity of his hypotheses on subjects of bacteriology and the boldness of his experiments in diseases of the skin, was none other than Arsène Lupin. It is probable also that Arsène Lupin was the professor who introduced the Japanese art of jiu-jitsu to the Parisian public. We have some reason to believe that Arsène Lupin was the bicyclist who won the Grand Prix de l'Exposition, received his ten thousand francs, and was never heard of again. Arsène Lupin may have been also the person who saved so many lives through the little dormer window at the charity bazaar, and at the same time picked their pockets. The judge paused for a moment, then continued. Such is that epoch which seems to have been utilized by you in a thorough preparation for the warfare you have since waged against society, a methodical apprenticeship in which you developed your strength, energy, and skill to the highest point possible. Do you acknowledge the accuracy of these facts? During this discourse the prisoner had stood balancing himself first on one foot, then on the other with shoulders stooped and arms inert. Under the strongest light one could observe his extreme thinness, his hollow cheeks, his projecting cheekbones, his earthen-coloured face dotted with small red spots and framed in a rough, straggling beard. Prison life had caused him to age and wither. He had lost the youthful face and elegant figure we had seen portrayed so often in the newspapers. It appeared as if he had not heard the question propounded by the judge. Twice it was repeated to him. Then he raised his eyes, seemed to reflect. Then, making a desperate effort, he murmured, Baudru, Désiré. The judge smiled as he said, I do not understand the theory of your defense, Arsène Lupin. If you are seeking to avoid responsibility for your crimes on the ground of imbecility, such a line of defence is open to you, but I shall proceed with the trial and pay no heed to your vagaries. 
he then narrated at length the various thefts swindles and forgeries charged against lupin sometimes he questioned the prisoner but the latter simply grunted or remained silent the examination of witnesses commenced some of the evidence given was immaterial other portions of it seemed more important but through all of it there ran a vein of contradictions and inconsistencies a wearisome obscurity enveloped the proceedings until detective ganimard was called as a witness then interest was revived from the beginning the actions of the veteran detective appeared strange and unaccountable he was nervous and ill at ease several times he looked at the prisoner with obvious doubt and anxiety then with his hands resting on the rail in front of him he recounted the events in which he had participated including his pursuit of the prisoner across europe and his arrival in america he was listened to with great avidity as his capture of arsene lupin was well known to every one through the medium of the press toward the close of his testimony after referring to his conversations with arsene lupin he stopped twice embarrassed and undecided it was apparent that he was possessed of some thought which he feared to utter the judge said to him sympathetically if you are ill you may retire for the present no no but he stopped looked sharply at the prisoner and said i ask permission to scrutinize the prisoner at closer range there is some mystery about him that i must solve he approached the accused man examined him attentively for several minutes then returned to the witness stand and in an almost solemn voice he said i declare on oath that the prisoner now before me is not arsene lupin a profound silence followed the statement the judge nonplussed for a moment exclaimed oh, what do you mean that is absurd the detective continued at first sight there is a certain resemblance, but if you carefully consider the nose, the mouth, the hair, the color of skin, you will see that it is not Arsène Lupin. And the eyes! Did he ever have those alcoholic eyes? Come, come, witness, what do you mean? Do you pretend to say that we are trying the wrong man? In my opinion, yes. Arsène Lupin has, in some manner, contrived to put this poor devil in his place, unless this man is a willing accomplice. This dramatic denouement caused much laughter and excitement amongst the spectators. The judge adjourned the trial and sent for M. Bouvier, the jailer and guards employed in the prison. When the trial was resumed, M. Bouvier and the jailer examined the accused and declared that there was only a very slight resemblance between the prisoner and Arsène Lupin. "'Well, then,' exclaimed the judge, "'who is this man? Where does he come from? What is he in prison for?' Two of the prison guards were called, and both of them declared that the prisoner was Arsène Lupin. The judge breathed once more. But one of the guards then said, "'Yes, yes, I think it is he.' what cried the judge impatiently you think it is he what do you mean by that well i saw very little of the prisoner he was placed in my charge in the evening and for two months he seldom stirred but laid on his bed with his face to the wall what about the time prior to those two months before that he occupied a cell in another part of the prison he was not in cell twenty four here the head jailer interrupted and said, We changed him to another cell after his attempted escape. But you, monsieur, you have seen him during those two months? I had no occasion to see him. He was always quiet and orderly. And this prisoner is not Arsène Lupin? No. Then who is he? demanded the judge. I do not know then we have before us a man who was substituted for Arsène Lupin two months ago. How do you explain that? I cannot. In absolute despair, the judge turned to the accused and addressed him in a conciliatory tone. Prisoner, can you tell me how and since when you became an inmate of the prison de la Santé? 
the engaging manner of the judge was calculated to disarm the mistrust and awaken the understanding of the accused man he tried to reply finally under clever and gentle questioning he succeeded in framing a few phrases from which the following story was gleaned two months ago he had been taken to the depot examined and released as he was leaving the building a free man he was seized by two guards and placed in the prison van since then he had occupied cell twenty four he was contented there plenty to eat and he slept well so he did not complain all that seemed probable and amidst the mirth and excitement of the spectators the judge adjourned the trial until the story could be investigated and verified End of chapter three part one part two of the extraordinary adventures of arsene lupin gentleman burglar this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Extraordinary Adventures of Arsène Lupin, Gentleman Burglar, by Maurice Leblanc. Chapter 3. The Escape of Arsène Lupin. Part 2. The following facts were at once established by an examination of the prison records. Eight weeks before, a man named Baudreux Désiré had slept at the depot. He was released the next day, and left the depot at two o'clock in the afternoon. On the same day at two o'clock, having been examined for the last time, Arsène Lupin left the depot in a prison van. Had the guards made a mistake? Had they been deceived by the resemblance, and carelessly substituted this man for their prisoner? Another question suggested itself. Had the substitution been arranged in advance? In that event, Baudreux must have been an accomplice, and must have caused his own arrest for the express purpose of taking Lupin's place. But then, by what miracle had such a plan, based on a series of improbable chances, been carried to success? Baudreux Désiré was turned over to the anthropological service. They had never seen anything like him. However, they easily traced his past history. He was known at Courbevoie at asnières and at le valois he lived on alms and slept in one of those rag-pickers huts near the barrier de terne he had disappeared from there a year ago had he been enticed away by arsène lupin there was no evidence to that effect and even if that was so it did not explain the flight of the prisoner that still remained a mystery amongst twenty theories which sought to explain it not one was satisfactory of the escape itself there was no doubt an escape that was incomprehensible sensational in which the public as well as the officers of the law could detect a carefully prepared plan a combination of circumstances marvellously dovetailed whereof the denouement fully justified the confident prediction of arsène lupin i shall not be present at my trial after a month of patient investigation the problem remained unsolved the poor devil of a baudreux could not be kept in prison indefinitely and to place him on trial would be ridiculous there was no charge against him consequently he was released but the chief of the sureté resolved to keep him under surveillance this idea originated with ganimard from his point of view there was neither complicity nor chance baudreux was an instrument upon which arsène lupin had played with his extraordinary skill Baudreux, when set at liberty, would lead them to Arsène Lupin, or at least to some of his accomplices. The two inspectors, Follenfant and Duty, were assigned to assist Ganimard. One foggy morning in January, the prison gates opened, and Baudreux Désiré stepped forth, a free man. At first he appeared to be quite embarrassed, and walked like a person who has no precise idea whither he is going. He followed the Rue de la Santé and the Rue Saint-Jacques. He stopped in front of an old clothes shop, removed his jacket and his vest, sold his vest on which he realized a few sous, then, replacing his jacket, he proceeded on his way. He crossed the Seine. At the Châtelet an omnibus passed him. He wished to enter it, but there was no place. The controller advised him to secure a number, so he entered the waiting-room. Ganimard called to his two assistants, and without removing his eyes from the waiting-room, he said to them, stop a carriage no two that will be better 
I will go with one of you, and we will follow him. The men obeyed. Yet Baudru did not appear. Ganimard entered the waiting-room. It was empty. <sighs> Idiot that I am, he muttered. I forgot there was another exit. There was an interior corridor extending from the waiting-room to the Rue Saint-Martin. Ganimard rushed through it, and arrived just in time to observe Baudreau upon the top of the Batignolles Jardin de Platte omnibus as it was turning the corner of the Rue de Rivoli. He ran and caught the omnibus, but he had lost his two assistants. He must continue the pursuit alone. In his anger he was inclined to seize the man by the collar without ceremony. Was it not with premeditation and by means of an ingenious ruse that his pretended imbecile had separated him from his assistants? He looked at Baudreux. The latter was asleep on the bench, his head rolling from side to side, his mouth half opened, and an incredible expression of stupidity on his blotched face. No, such an adversary was incapable of deceiving old Ganimard. It was a stroke of luck, nothing more. At the Galerie Lafayette the man leapt from the omnibus and took the La Muette tramway, following the boulevard Haussmann and the avenue Victor Hugo. Baudreux alighted at La Muette station, and with a nonchalant air strolled into the Bois de Boulogne. He wandered through one path after another, and sometimes retraced his steps. What was he seeking? Had he any definite object? At the end of an hour he appeared to be faint from fatigue, and noticing a bench he sat down. The spot, not far from Auteuil, on the edge of a pond hidden amongst the trees, was absolutely deserted. After the lapse of another half-hour, Ganimard became impatient and resolved to speak to the man. He approached and took a seat beside Baudreux, lighted a cigarette, traced some figures in the sand with the end of his cane, and said, "'It's a pleasant day.' No response. But suddenly the man burst into laughter, a happy, mirthful laugh, spontaneous and irresistible. Ganimard felt his hair stand on end, in horror and surprise. It was that laugh, that infernal laugh he knew so well. With a sudden movement he seized the man by the collar and looked at him with a keen, penetrating gaze, and found that he no longer saw the man Baudreux. To be sure, he saw Baudreux, but at the same time he saw the other, the real man, Lupin. He discovered the intense life in the eyes, he filled up the shrunken features, he perceived the real flesh beneath the flabby skin the real mouth through the grimaces that deformed it. Those were the eyes and mouth of the other, and especially his keen, alert, mocking expression, so clear and youthful. 